How do we stop being ignorant of the holy? Let's go to the book of Romans, chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Therefore, an old man told me one time, every time you see therefore, you should ask what there is for and why it's there. I want you to listen to something. What is Paul saying? Therefore, what does he mean? He means this. He says, look back at the last 11 chapters that I've written to you and look at all the great things that God has done. And then live your life based upon this mercy of God that has been granted to you. You see, knowledge of the holy begins with this, a recognition of the first three chapters of the book of Romans. Yes, all revivals and reformations come out of the book of Romans because it's pure theology and it teaches us about a pristine God. A knowledge of the holy comes with realizing that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the only thing that man deserves is wrath. And then moving into chapters 4 and 5, the glory of God revealed in Christ. You have to have a knowledge not only of your sin, but you have to have a knowledge of God and what He's done for you in Christ. And the great work of salvation in chapter 6 and chapter 7. And the great work of the power of God in your life in chapter 8. And the great work of sovereignty of God in chapters 8, 9, and 11. When you study the whole counsel of God, not just little principles of the Christian life, but when you know God and His counsels, by that motivation, you are called upon to do what? To offer your life as a sacrifice to God. To offer your bodies as a sacrifice to God. Why does he say bodies here? Because he's wanting us not to make this into some kind of just loose metaphor that requires nothing. He's not saying to you that he wants you to have an attitude of sacrifice. I hear these preachers today who want to protect themselves. And when they talk about the rich young ruler, they say, well, you know now, don't take that too serious, congregation. Don't come under any condemnation. Don't think now you have to give anything up. Of course, Jesus was just talking about an attitude. He would never ask you to give up everything. It's strange. He's asked me to do it three times. It's not an attitude here. He's literally saying, you give your life to God. But we find we don't want to. Why? Not just because of some remnant of carnal nature living in us, but because of our lack of the knowledge of God. If you could only catch a glimpse, a heavenly glimpse of who God is. If you could only see His wonder and His glory and His passion and His power and His love. If you could only just for one moment be taken to a place where you might get a clear vision of who He is, you'd throw yourself on God. You'd be willing to cut yourself up in a thousand pieces and throw them around the world. But there is no vision of God, and therefore the people perish. There is no law of God, therefore the people perish. Christianity is surviving today in America by being propped up, not by power. It's because we don't know God. Now, for you ministerial students, I want to tell you something. It's very, very important. If your Bible study is Bible study only because it's used to prepare sermons, then you'll become as useless as a lot of men have become in the kingdom of God. Most Bible study today is done only to prepare messages, and therefore, men do not know God. Bible study is to know God. I don't particularly care how much time you spend on your message. What I care about is how much time you spend in God's Word. If you're going to be a preacher and you're going to fulfill a pulpit, then you get in that Bible hours and hours and hours a day. You lock yourself away. You make rules that say no one touches me until God's finished with me. Or what will happen? You'll become a lap boy for a bunch of carnal Christians in the church who don't want to do anything. You'll run around and be serving them and doing all kinds of things they're supposed to do. 
You've got to be a man of the Word. You've got to live with God. How many of you young ministerial students have gone out into a mountain for days without food and without friends and without carnal Christian music and sought God to His face? Throw rocks at the heavens saying, God, come down. Saying, God, I will give you no rest until you show me your glory. How many of you are that bold? Or how many of you are going to grow up and play church all your life? Learn how to do the denominational thing. Make no waves. Conform to everything. Because that's the way to get ahead. Cooperation. Are you going to be a man of God? Mint this wicked generation. There's got to be a knowledge of the holy. Some of you dress like lost people. You watch things that only lost people should watch. You talk the way only lost people should talk. You worship like lost people. Because no one's ever told you that there's such things as modesty and godliness. Like I said last night, 30 years ago, unbelievers had more Christian principles than Christians today. We have forgotten how to blush. Some of you watched things last night you shouldn't have been watching. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. It's funny, when I talk about the theology of the holiness of God, everyone gets so excited. And when I talk about the practicality of it, everyone says I'm a legalist. But how do you find this knowledge? Look in verse 2. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. The word means this is do not be, do not be conformed to the image of this world. In Peru, when we're building a church out in the, out in the high jungle, we use mud and we take a box about this big. And we fill it full of loose sand so that the mud won't stick to it. And then we fill it full of mud and then we flip it over and a block comes out. And we can make every block just the same because we have the same mold. The world has a mold. Satan has a mold. Religion has a mold to make you just like you ought to be. But they're going to make you not like God wants you to be. And you're to break out of that mold. And there's only one way. How? By renewing your mind. Be transformed, be metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind in God's Word. Many of us are awake about 16 hours a day. Some of us a lot less and some of us a lot more. And constantly, because we live in a wicked generation, our minds are being bombarded with garbage, with filth, with sewer from the world. I have young men come to me all the time and say, I have so much trouble with my thought life. Well, of course you do. For 16 hours a day, you're swimming in a sewer. And you spend no time in God's Word. The only way to have a renewed mind is for the power of the Word of God to fulfill and fill your mind. You need the Word. You need the Word. You need to memorize the Word. You need to read the Word. You need to study the Word. You need to meditate in the Word. The Word, the Word, the Word. God said, put it on the doorpost of your home. When you sit down and when you rise up and when you walk through the streets, the Word of God. Throw away some of this carnal, stupid Christian music you're listening to. A lot of those people don't even know anything about God. Start memorizing the Word of God. Most of you live your life based on flimsy little songs. And not upon the Word of God. You've got to get into the Word. You've got to love the Word. It's got to be a passion for you. We honor the old prophets, don't we? We honor the Tozers and the Spurgeons. But we don't want to pay the price they paid. And they paid the price by being men who walked alone, who lived with God and loved His Word. 